Welcome to the Mind of Business Success Podcast. I have Dr. Eric Hulsapple with us, and we're going to talk about mindfulness and how you can use mindfulness to be more successful in your life and in your business. I want to welcome you to the show, Eric. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Mindfulness. Now, many of the business owners who are listening have at least a little bit of an understanding of what mindfulness is, what that term means. But I would be willing to bet that there are some people who really only understand it at a conceptual level and maybe don't even fully and completely understand it. Yeah. Let's start by talking about what mindfulness actually is is so we can just yeah. clear away any of those myths or misconceptions right off the bat yeah th there's a lot of uh com unnecessary confusion like you know if you talk to john cabot zinn from uh, mindful based stress reduction it's the ability to pay attention on purpose intentionally without judgment <clears throat> and you dig all that stuff down what you're really talking about is focus the ability to focus and those things that are often in the definition are things that like judgments that <clears throat> impede focus. So mindfulness is the ability to have my mind full of the thing I choose to have it full of at that moment to the exclusion of everything else. A lot of choices about there about what to put my attention on and a lot of a lot of competition for attention. You know, everybody wants a slice of it. Uh <laughs> from social media to the to to uh, anyway phones to it's it's nuts, but it's basically training ourselves to focus. And anything that you want to do of value takes some training of it, whether that's a sport or <clears throat> business or you know art, music. It takes some training. So we've really been trained and and businesses just so good at grabbing attention we've been we've been trained to put our attention on what other people want to have it and mindfulness is claiming it back and saying no it's my attention get your apps off my phone you know don't invade me and by the way i'm not having a you know my phone on during the this meeting i'm not going to have screens open I, we're going to actually talk you know, and I'm going to listen to you. Mindfulness is actually listening to what somebody says versus listening to your own internal conversation about how you're going to respond versus, you know, actually listening to what somebody's going to say. So it's it's a it's a deep practice, but it's very simple. It's focus. I'm sure people really resonate with this. This common struggle that we all have with social media and juggling a business and a family and some entrepreneurs just sort of fall into that category of a little ADD, a little ADHD. Um, sometimes they consider themselves multitaskers. <laughs> yeah. sometimes. I mean, I'm, I'm very ADD, extremely. So now... Here we are constantly bombarded by nonstop stimulus coming from everywhere. Yeah. And it's not even just the advertisements that are bombarding us. Like, you know, everybody says, oh, you know, you, you go on social media and it's just everybody vying for your attention. This advertisement here, this average, everyone everything. wants attention and, and everyone everything. and everything and everything. And so here yeah. we are, and we need to retrain ourselves. Yeah. So where does somebody begin? Take a walk. Leave your phone at home. Start with a short walk because you'll have separation anxiety. Go five minutes, 10 minutes, walk around the building. And at that time, just notice what's in your surroundings. You know, if you're if it's around your office building, notice the traffic, notice the trees, notice the wind. We're just divorced from nature. You know, we're not <clears throat> we're not really designed to be totally divorced from nature. But so many of us in a busy professional life where you're working eight, 10, 12 hours a day, and then you're going to, you know, pick up kids and go into the the sports things and doing this, we just get on a treadmill. So 
I, th I think that one of the best things you can do is take a walk. And if you and don't take your phone with you, or if you have to have it and say, oh, my, my wife might call or my husband might call on this or the doctor's going to, you know, you can block numbers except. If you have to accept a number and put your phone on silent, then do that. But just respect it and note, respect that and notice that right now I'm just, I'm just taking a walk. That's what I'm doing. It's a great place to start. So let's talk about some of the practical benefits of becoming more mindful. And I, I know yeah. that taking a walk is really just scratching the surface. So we'll probably go oh, a totally. little bit deeper, but for those who need to know why, why should I even bother with this whole mindfulness business? Now, hopefully if they're listening to this podcast, they're at least enough indoctrinated into some of our philosophies here that yeah. they, they get it. And they say, yes, absolutely. I want to embrace mastering my inner world just as much as my outer world. But for someone listening who says to themselves, I have goals and I'm a go-getter, and, yeah. and, right? Yeah. What are the benefits of becoming more mindful? Well, would you like to be able to focus on the goals that you'd like rather than the goals that every other company has for you, that the government has for you, that social media has for you? And, you know, it's, it is about taking your life back. It's about focusing on the goals. And first of all, clearing out, because what I find is that we've adopted culture's goals. We've adopted, we haven't really, most of us, and I can't say that universally, I don't know your audience, but most people I come across haven't taken the time to actually look inside and say, okay, I know that the government's mandate is that we consume as much as we can. You know, we make as many things as we can to GDP and the consumer confidence and all that. Okay, I know that. <clears throat> and I know, you know, what the companies want me to do is to work endlessly, work my weekends, work late, you know, don't take much time off. I, I know what everybody else's goals are for me. And I know culture tells me more is always better, you know. Uh, but what do I really want? You know, is it is it always the, you know, the second house? Is it always because I find that we we set up a goal and as we get close to it, we've always believed when I get to the goal, I'll be happy. And when we get close to it, when we get it, what I find is we just move the goalposts. We just move it. OK, we got the we got the in my era, it was oh six figure income. Can I just get there? You get there and then it's three, four times that. You know, it's the it's the second house or it's the, you know, first it's the vacation and then I got to have, you know, and it's almost endless uh, what we want in our desires. So I find you really have to take some time and draw some limits and say, no, this is what I need, you know, for it. And then <clears throat> what what we train on is how can you be happy now? Because if you haven't learned to be happy in the process of obtaining those goals, Usually you just change the goals and you're not happy once you get them. But you have to learn to enjoy the process that you're going along. And and goals are important. I mean, I don't know any successful business that doesn't set goals and whatnot. But also, <clears throat> it's, it's our ability to be present as we're working towards those goals. It's mindfulness. And then when we get those things, we get the house paid off and whatnot. It isn't just always just going and buy another one. Maybe it's, ah, you know, maybe it's grandkids. Maybe it's, you know, something else to spend the time with then versus society's goals for us, which is always producing more and consuming more. And I'm an economist. I think that's, you know, nothing wrong with it. But if we're doing it mindlessly, mindlessly and not happily, which was my story. I, mean, I was very successful and just not happy. I was stressed out. But successful in all business context, but personally, I was a mess. This is something that I'm sure a lot of people can relate to, regardless of what stage they're at in their life or in their business. Yeah. We do have so many goals that are not really rooted in our heart exactly. desires. Exactly. And for 
an individual who is overcompensating for insecurities, it's this never ending quest to achieve these externals in order to try to feel better. Maybe if I have the exactly. multi-million dollar business, I'll feel like I'm good enough. I'm yeah. worthy. I'm deserving. If I have the bigger house, then I can feel like I'm not a loser or a failure. And those are such superficial motivations that it's very difficult to feel happy in the process of achieving those things. And I'm a firm believer that if we get clear within ourselves, we'll we'll see what it is that we really desire. And if we're also being very, very honest about that desire, we'll see that we have two sets of motivations. One of them is like a more divine, authentic motivation. That's like our true mm -hmm. heart's desire, calling us towards mm -hmm. saying yes to ourselves and going for that goal. But then there's all those superficial programmed motivations yeah. that are sort of entangled. And so we have to sort that stuff out in order to say, no, this really is a good goal for me, but I have to be doing it for the right reasons. I'd love to know your philosophy on this, because I know that this is an area that you specialize in. You're helping yeah. your, your clients, um, you're helping so many people to get back into balance with themselves. And the ironic thing is that most of them are even more successful once they find it because they're, they have clarity around it. Uh, you know, uh, Harvard completed a study recently. It was a 70 year long study and they found the number one factor of uh, happiness was long-term relationships. It wasn't money. It wasn't things. It was, you know, the ability. They even found that the, that reduced stress because those people had someone to talk to about things. And I find that over and over again with the people that I work with, you know, a lot of times they come in, you know, work on, and they and they think it's, you know, I just need that next level of financial success. I just need this or that. And they come away when they say, you know, what's really important to me is my family. And I, I'm so busy working that I don't make the ball games and I, you know, I'm running in or I'm on my phone after I get home, I'm texting in and I'm not really there at the dinner table. And uh, so learning to focus at work, it then also allows us to turn that off and turn that focus to home when we get there, you know, and having the confidence of, you know, they can wait till the morning. <laughs> you know, I don't need to be on every, because, because, most in the relation, what most people want from us is our attention. Kids, if you give your kids your your attention, that's they'd much rather have that than a, than Disney World. You know, I got to be so busy, I can't be there this week. But we're going to Disney World next week. No, they really want you just to be there. And that same skill is when you're with that tough client or that big client. That next thing allows you to focus on that person and listen to them and deliver to them what their business needs and take you to the next level. And if you can't focus, then you miss so many cues. You know, you miss what somebody's really trying to tell you, someone else in your office that has something you should know and you just haven't, you know, been available and haven't listened to them. So it's a huge thing and it reduces stress and it improves relationships, uh, cuts down meeting time, makes you more efficient. It's really, really worth it. And it, and I'll just jump to this. It just takes a lot less time than most people figure. You know, a lot of, a lot of times meditation will help because it's learning to focus on your breath, which is the same thing as focusing on your voice. When you're talking to me, how do I focus on someone talking to me with everything else? Well, we practice by ourselves with our breath or a mantra or something. We usually start with two minutes, work up to 10 over about six months. And people find they become so much more efficient, they start wanting to make that little bit of time to do it. Uh, and it doesn't have to be meditation, but in a busy world, in a busy, when you don't have time to take walks in nature and do the other things, that it, it's just one of the most efficient practices. I think adopting these types of 
practices are, it's, it's so valuable and so many, it, and there's so much scientific, Oh, it's, huge. it's so much scientific research to validate the, the benefits physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Uh, and I found that when someone really is, uh, maybe they, I'll go back to the example I used before. They consider themselves ADD, ADHD. Maybe they consider themselves to be uh, an overachiever. Um, you know, those fun fun labels that we give ourselves to put ourselves in a nice, nice convenient mm-hmm. little, little box of, of self-imposed limitation. Um, there is a bit of a struggle oftentimes for those individuals to be still long Mm -hmm. enough to you could say meditate some people just literally will say i can't meditate so as a certified hypnotherapist i've heard for so many right so so many people say i i can't i just can't relax i just can't shut my mind off but you know what else is so interesting is um i've also found that someone who couldn't quote, quote, right. I can't meditate or I could never meditate anytime. You know, I tried, it just didn't Mm -hmm. work. Um, being guided by someone helps to induce that state. And once you've experienced it, it's so much easier to recreate it. And then that same client would say after, you know, after hypnosis, now I can, I can meditate or, you know, whatever. And now, it, and Agreed. I think that being open-minded enough to try different things, I'm sure you have a ton of resources and suggestions that you provide to people where they can begin to experience what processes, what techniques can I try to see what works best for me so I can start to actually learn how to be more mindful, learn how to be more focused, learn how to be more intentional. Yeah. And it's more like training a puppy than almost any other analogy I can think because our mind or people say, you know, Oh, when I go there, I start watching my mind. It's just gets crazier. I, I just can't meditate. Yeah. Well, it's always been crazy. You're just haven't placed your attention there. And it's the thing is that that's the brain waves that are going nuts. that is causing the stress. You know, our program is called Living in the Gap, the gap between when one thought start, stops and another one begins. You know, where is that? Can I have those little spaces? Because that's where joy is and peace is in those little spaces. It's not what life brings us. It's what we think about it. I mean, life is a bunch of calamities, certain death for all of us. <laughs> and it is stressful when, when all we're just in what we think about that all the time. It's not what's happening. It's could I be present to it? If I can just accept and be present to what's happening, my mind slows down and I can be there and things get better, you know, just by the the way I'm looking at it. So I think starting small uh, apps or a group can be really helpful because you're you're supporting each other to get started. I I haven't tried uh, hypnosis, but I bet it would be awesome as a way to start to meditate. But it's start small, like a a couple of minutes. You know, if you wanted your kids to eat vegetables, you don't start with the whole plate and say, jam that down. You say, eat one pea and then you can have your dessert. You know, when they eat that one pea and two days later, maybe it's two peas. You know, it's just a little bit of a slice to get, you know, into something. So I say start really small and start taking a walk. Start with gratitude. Gratitude's the lowest hanging fruit in this business. It's uh, an immediate mindset shift. It changed your brain to start looking for things to be grateful for rather than the things that you don't have. And it takes a minute to think of three things that I'm grateful for today. It's an immediate shift and it doesn't have the, you know, uh, whatever meditation has. It has a little bit of a a uh, rub to it to a lot of people. A lot of times we call it centering instead of meditation, just because of that mindfulness and meditation or some of you know, just, I don't know why, but uh, they're over, over complicated, but it's mostly being president, uh, learning to pay attention to something, you know, and the other thing is notice what you really like to do when you're present. Like some people it's fly fishing for me, it's snow skiing. For my wife, it's art. 
And notice when you are really focused, most people have something that they are. Maybe it's knitting, maybe, I don't know. Most people have something, golf. Notice that, and then, then you try to bring that slice. I try to say, bring that. can we bring that to work? Wouldn't it be great to bring that in and have that at my workplace? So I didn't work like eight or 10 hours a day and then come exhausted to try to you know enjoy myself. I could actually have a slice of my day. And I'm not saying it's going to be all day long because we all have things that we, you know, accounting and bills, and we all have things that maybe we don't want to deal with. So I'm not saying it's going to be, you know, a heaven all day long, but slices of your day where it's just like, ah, I just really enjoyed talking to those people. You know, I just really enjoyed that. We've been talking up to this point, a lot about the benefits for us as the individual, but I'd like to talk at least just a tiny little bit about how it benefits others around us. Oh, yeah. Our employees, our family. You mentioned a little bit about, you know, just be present with your children. They want your presence. But let's talk a little bit about how we see things improving in all areas of our life, in our business, when we begin to adopt this practice of being more mindful. Well, what if I just I'll tell you a little bit of story of how it happened at our or at our company if they have time like so I started uh, I was in my early 30s I was a CEO in my 20s and really stressed out and I I'll, I'll skip a lot of the details because I know we don't have time this morning but basically I came across yoga and then later my brother introduced me to meditation and for years though I just did it as a private practice I say I didn't come out. You know, I didn't tell anybody, you know, you didn't want to be one of those woo woo weirdos. <laughs> well, it wasn't even a thing back then. I mean, that it, it was only in India, you know, and there weren't yoga studios all over. I was doing it myself. And then uh, years later, people started knowing, cha noticing changes in me. I went from I'm a hard charging, you know, 150 mile an hour guy that I would actually stop and talk to somebody. And I was somebody, someone come in to say, Hey, my wife left me last night. You know, what, you know, those kind of things, what, what can I do? And I just being able to came somebody that somebody could talk to. And one at a time, people started to be interested. And we started a seed group in our company where we just started with two or three of us. We'd meet once a month, read a book like an Eckhart Tolle book or something and talk about it and maybe center for a little bit and start getting to know each other. Before I knew it, the room was full. Then the management company adopted a, a vision statement called Mindfully Creating Community. We brought man mindful-based stress reduction in and everybody in the company did it. And I learned a great lesson there that, I mean, everybody, they did it. Not everybody liked it. It was like you having to eat your peas. And afterwards, a lot of people just dropped it. I really learned that everybody doesn't have to meditate. If you can get a core, like, first of all, one person in a house makes a huge difference. One person that's not resisting and making <laughs> things worse makes a huge difference in a house. Same as with a company, particularly if it's at the top. You know, one person that's changing their demeanor. I always say, if the practice is any good, everyone doesn't have to do it. You're enough. You know, because you can feel things and you're doing differently. If everybody has to do it, it's not much of a practice. So you're enough to start with it and do it. But if you can get, you know, up around that 50%, man, it just changes everything. You know, uh, and it doesn't have to be all sitting formal meditation, but it's a mindset of I'm going to be more mindful. I'm more intentional. I'm going to make the community a better place. You know, I'm not going to waste my time. I'm going to do what I say. Those things, those simple little things are just game changers. And it's, but you need to take a little bit of time out and practice. So you start noticing because we're so habitual. The good news is if you start the mindfulness habit, that's habitual too. And you don't have to pay attention to it all the time. Just start, you just start being more grateful over time, but our habits run 90 plus percent of us, you know, so we have to get rid of some old habits, train ourselves some new habits, which is a process and takes some time. But the good news is once we've got the momentum of those new habits, man, that's just like going downwind, you know, being downwind all day versus running uphill. So start small, you know, be smart with yourself. Start with yourself and <laughs> start small 
have a good intention, you know, maybe cut some time out to go do something on a weekend, a workshop or something where you can dive in a little bit deeper. But on a daily basis, we're already too busy. We already have too much things. So to tell somebody off the off the bat, hey, you got to do this hour long, you know, it's just not feasible. But start small uh, over a long period of time and it can just make a huge difference. I know we are just about at the end of time. I want to talk really briefly, though, about your book. Can right. you uh, give us sort of the high level overview, yeah. if you will? Profit with Presence, the 12 Pillars of Mindful Leadership. And I really start out and just talk about how, you know, there's a there's a there's a break between the mindfulness community and business in that mindfulness kind of money's kind of dirty and businesses that's woo woo. I say that's you know we're in a capitalist society it's got to be okay to make money. You know, and I say affluence increases your influence, you can make a bigger difference. So we got to get over that and we got to have and the book lays out, you know, how you can how you can do both. How you can be really successful and have good intention and make the world a better place. You know, it isn't about going up if most people that I'm going to make this money. And then after that time, then I'm going to start being mindful and serve in the community. And I say, well, that's not really how it works. You can do it all at once, you know, and that's that's how you train yourself. So once you have the the financial resources, you know what to do with them. So um, it's uh, 12 pillars of mindful leadership, different little things and stories about how you can really start small and integrate this into your whole life. And the good thing is you can learn it at work. And when you go home, it makes your home life so much better. This has been such a valuable conversation. I know we probably could keep going since we do not have time. I've got to make sure our listeners know yeah. how they can connect with you. So can you share your website uh, anywhere else you want our listeners to reach out or follow you? Yeah. Living in the gap spelled out dot org. It's a nonprofit. There's a 21 day introduction to mindfulness series. There are 10 minutes of mindful movement and learning the two minutes of mind meditation, moving up to five. Uh, there's a, a list of 10 books you might get to get started. There's some free meditation, uh, how to meditate material on there. You can sign up for our newsletter as well. You can buy the book there, Profit with Presence, 12 Pillars of Mindful Leadership, and on Amazon. And that kind of outlines our program. Awesome. Thank you so much, Eric. Thanks for having uh, me. I love having guests fun. like you on. Uh, this is you know, these are the types of topics that are near and dear to my heart. Uh, like you, you know, it's about finding that balance between being an entrepreneur, thinking like an entrepreneur, uh, you know, doing the day to day um, as a business owner. But it's so much more. Life is so much more. Yeah. We are so much more. And what are we doing all of it for, if not for the joy and the fulfillment and giving back and just being the best version of yourself that you can be, which is an evolving journey. So thank yeah. you so much for being thank you. with thank, us today. Thank you, for, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. And thank you to all of our listeners. You know, we're doing this for you. If you haven't already subscribed, make sure you do so. And until next time, we will see you in the next episode.